archaeologist, philosopher, bonsai aficionado, author, black belt, and squanderer of over 50,000 hours watching B-movies. Using archaeology to dig deep and connect clues, he uses this wealth of useless knowledge to bring you classic snarky movie reviews and world-famous short summaries. Now broadcasting from beautiful downtown Tallahassee, it's Nantan Lupan at the Drive-In. Hello. Today we are going to continue with the October 2014 Frankenstein line. Today's film is Son of Frankenstein, 1939. It's the last of the three universal Frankensteins and in many ways may be the best of the three. Basil Rathbone was a much better actor than many of the others cast in this role. Bela Lugosi was amazing as Igor, both frightening and enthralling. His hands did half his acting. Also, Karloff was able to spend more time upright as the monster and showed more of his range of emotions. They covered many of the problems like the exploding castle, but fell short on the forgiveness of Dr. F. Today's first character is Basil Rathbone, who played Baron Wolf von Frankenstein, the son of Henry. Rathbone was born in South Africa in 1892, but left as a result of the forthcoming Boer War. In England, Rathbone attended Repton School where he excelled in fencing, a skill that would serve him well later in the movies, and showed an interest in theater. After graduation, he worked for one year in business to please his father, and then left for the theater. He had a cousin that was managing one of the Shakespearean troops in Stafford-on-Avon, he joined at the bottom rung and began working his way up to larger roles. These roles were interrupted by World War I when Rathbone served as a second lieutenant in the Liverpool Scottish 2nd Battalion. He was assigned to military intelligence and later received the Military Cross for bravery. In 1919, he returned to Stratford-on-Avon. After a year there, he moved to the London stage and eventually began working on Broadway. Eventually, he left the stage to begin working in movies. His roles evolved from ladies' man to sinister villain, where his sword work became more important. The 1930s were very good for him, where he had a run of costume dramas that included Captain Blood, 1935, David Copperfield, 1935, A Tale of Two Cities, 1935, Anna Karenina, 1935, The Adventures of Robin Hood, 1938, The Mark of Zorro, 1940, Romeo and Juliet, 1936, and If I Were King, 1938. In 1939, Rathbone took the role for which he was most famous, that of Sherlock Holmes in The Hounds of the Baskervilles, 1939. Over the next seven years, there was a total of 145 Sherlock Holmes movies starring Rathbone. Following World War II, Rathbone returned to the stage trying to lose the stereotype of Holmes. However, this was not successful. He continued to work in movies until his death. Boris Karloff played the role of the monster. Again, I don't think I will get much argument if I say that he was the greatest Frank of them all, although Peter Boyle was pretty good. Karloff was a British actor that began stage work in Canada and then made his way to Hollywood. He made some silent films but had to maintain jobs such as Ditch Digger to survive. By 1931, Karloff was on his way with The Criminal Code 1931 and Five Star Finale 1931 a film that was nominated for the Academy Award for Best Picture. Of course, the biggest role of all was that of the monster in Frankenstein, 1931. Karloff was about 5 feet 11 inches tall, and the costume that he wore for the work had 4-inch platform heels on the shoes that weighed 8 pounds each. Karloff's costume was designed by Jack P. Pierce and was copyrighted by Universal, making it harder for other studios to copy the success of Frankenstein. Oddly, Lon Chaney Sr., father of the Wolfman Lon Chaney Jr., was offered the role of the monster, but died before the filming. It was then offered to Bella Lugosi, who turned it down because he didn't want to be covered by makeup. A year later, Karloff played Imhotep in The Mummy and the starring role in The Mask of Fu Manchu. He played non-Tara genres as well, such as being gunned down in a bowling alley scene in Scarface 1932 and a religious soldier in the Lost Patrol, 1934. However, it seemed that horror was his thing. Karloff played in four Frankenstein movies. The original, Today's Movie, Bride of Frankenstein, 1935, House of Frankenstein, 1944, 
in the 1958 Frankenstein 1970 as the grandson of the original creator, where he showed that the original Baron had given his own face to the monster. Uh, make that five, and he did some voiceover work in a sixth. Bella Lugosi played the role of Igor, the friend and controller of the monster. I'll have to try and read this. Lugosi was born Bila Farinek Dizo Belasco in 1882 in Logos, Austria, Hungary. Now Loigo, Romania. Oof, that was a mouthful. Uh, during World War I, Lugosi was an infantry lieutenant in the Austro-Hungarian Army. Yes, that is correct. It was the other side. Since he was active in the Actors' Union during the Hungarian Revolution of 1919, he was forced to leave his homeland. For a time, he continued to act in Berlin, but left for America in 1920. He arrived in New Orleans in December 1920. This makes me wonder, were the rats disappearing on the boat, and did he mingle with the Crescent City vampires? After working on the stage for three years, he got his first silent screen role in America. He had been in a dozen or so in Hungary. By 1927, he was back on Broadway in the role of Dracula. It had always been rumored that Lon Chaney Sr. was the first choice for this role, but died before shooting began. There is some controversy with this, as Chaney was under contract with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and would not have been available. Well, Lugosi got the role, and since then he's been the archetypical vampire to most of us. However, this stuck Lugosi in the horror genre. Lugosi helped to organize the Screen Actors Guild in the mid-1930s and joined as member number 28. Lugosi was typed into the horror genre because of his accent. A change of ownership at Universal caused the number of horror roles to decrease. He also began taking opiates for his war wound. He finished his career in B-movies such as Glenn or Glenda, 1953, and Plan 9 from Outer Space, 1955, which was completed with a stunt double following his death. He died of a heart attack August 16, 1956, buried in his full Dracula costume, including a cape. Lon Latwell played the role of Inspector Crowe. He was educated in London and began his screen work at the age of 20. In 1915, he came to America. He was in 25 plays on Broadway and had his first major film role in 1932. He had a deep voice and a bullying manner. Served him well in his role as nobleman, mad doctor, military and policeman. He usually wore a trademark thin mustache. His roles included Captain Blood 1935 and To Be or Not to Be 1942. His career was ruined in 1943 after he was implicated in what was described as an orgy at his house that included naked guests, pornographic film, and a rape that occurred during the event. Josephine Hutchison played the role of Elsa von Frankenstein. An American, she came to Hollywood in 1934 to work for Warners. She had mostly small roles, including one in North by Northwest, 1959. She worked a lot in television in the 50s and 60s. Normally, I wouldn't mention the child actor Donnie Dunnigan, who played Peter von Frankenstein, as a child in the movie, he wasn't afraid of anything, and that must be true of him in real life. His debut was in Mother Carey's Chickens, 1938. After Sons, he was the voice talent for Young Bambi, 1942. He later became a career Marine, 1952 to 77, serving in Vietnam and working in counterintelligence. There is one unconfirmed actor and two uncredited actors in this film. Dwight Fry, the original assistant, was supposed to be one of the villagers. Ward Bond was in an uncredited role as a gendarme, and famous Olympian Jim Thorpe was one of the town's burgermeisters. Story. In the tiny village of Frankenstein, the burgermeister, Lawrence Grant, said he had two boxes to give the new Baron Frankenstein when they returned to the village. Two minutes into this film, it is clear that one of the boxes has a note for monster creating. They could just throw it in the fire. It's like the House of Slytherin. Why not just wipe those guys out and save a lot of trouble? Or don't build a King Kong-sized door. The son of Henry Frankenstein, Baron Wolf von Frankenstein, played by Basil Rathbone, his wife Elsa, Josephine Hutchison, and their young son Peter, Donnie Dunnigan, returned to the ancestral village. The village was located somewhere near hell, as shown by the exterior landscape seen during the train trip. Glowy skies and dead trees. It could be a World War I no-man's land, I suppose. Elsa even questioned Wolf about the landscape. Yeah, she called him Wolf. 
So anyway, it's been 25 years since the monster terrorized the local landscape, so surely all must be forgiven and forgotten. Igor, Bela Lugosi, has been living in the ruined castle for some time. It's not clear if he's the Fritz character or just a hanged grave robber that took residence inside the castle. Oh, by the way, did I mention the castle was not destroyed? But we saw it explode when the destructor lever in Bride was pulled. Don't worry, they'll fix that up in a bit. The Frank family arrives at the town and the entire village and city council has turned out in a late night violent rainstorm. The Burgermeister states, We are here to greet you, but not to make you welcome. Wolf Frankenstein gives them the old, why can't we all just get along speech, but they walk out on him. The Franks take a car to the castle. You know, it's modern times there now. The front door of the castle has huge knockers. What knockers? Oh, thank you, Doctor. They reconnect with Amelia, Emma Dunn, the nanny, Lang, Lionel Belmore, the butler, and Benson, Edgar Norton, Wolf's faithful assistant. They are introduced to the Tyrolean helpers, Ewald Newmuller, Michael Marks, and Mrs. Newmiller, Carol Cook, because the locals refuse to work for them. When Ilsa goes to the bedroom, the beds are head to head. Amelia tells her, if the house is filled with dread, place the beds head to head. Yet they stay. So the first night, Old Wolf reads the papers from the monster creating box and decides dear old dad was just misunderstood. He dashes over to the lab where Igor tries to kill him. But they quickly become friends and Igor shows Wolf the body of the monster, Boris Karloff, laying peacefully in a coma. Igor explains that he was put in a coma by a lightning strike. Dr. F sees the monster move and gets to do the old it's a lie bit. Igor explains that Dr. F and the monster are brothers from another mother. Spectre Crow, Lionel Atwell, tries to set Dr. F straight, but Wolfie downplays the damage done by the monster until Krogh states, One does not easily forget, Herr Baron, an arm torn out by the root. Krogh tells Dr. F that if the villagers bother, he will take a hand. See what he did? He only had one hand. Dr. F. explains the castle destruction by making the laboratory a separate building that only had the roof blown off of it. Dr. F. brings Benson to help against Igor's objections. They fix the lab up and begin probing and prodding the comatose monster. It seems at one point they hook up a CPAP to the monster. Dr. F. reveals that his dad attracted cosmic rays instead of lightning rays, and that's why the monster is superhuman. The city council meets again and reveal that six of the eight people that sentenced Igor to be hanged have been murdered. Did I mention that Igor had been hung, pronounced dead, was tossed into the castle, but wasn't dead? Since his execution had been carried out correctly, and he was hung by the neck until pronounced dead, they didn't feel they could hang him again. The council questioned Igor and then hired Ewald Neumuller as an in-castle spy. Dr. F. shocks the monster with a generator charge and feels that he has failed to revive the creature. Dr. F.'s kid reports that a giant has been coming to visit him. Yet they stay. Dr. F. sees the monster and the monster has a pity party in front of the mirror. It is clear that Igor is controlling the monster. Just for effect, there is an old Roman sulfur spring under the castle that has now grown to over 800 degrees. See where this is going? It's also a reference to hell being the birthplace of the monster. Igor sends the monster out to kill and then uses a shofar to bring him home, not a violin. He kills the other two jury members and Benson is missing. Now Bill Cosby always said that as a child the monster was the scariest of all to them. But as an adult he wondered how a monster that slow could kill anyone. Well they show how in this movie. A monster hangs from a tree like an ape and grabs the victim by the neck quickly snapping it. While well, true to form, the villagers get their torches and pitchforks and head for the castle. Spectre Krogh shows up and Dr. F. almost misses the dartboard. Cats beware. The inspector breaks the case with the help of the sun and finds the entrance to the underground cave that leads to the lab. He also finds Benson's body. The doc goes to the lab and shoots Igor in self-defense. When the monster sees Igor is dead, he goes crazy. The monster heads to Peter's room to kidnap him. Meanwhile, 
The inspector plays a little darts and holds the darts by sticking them in his wooden arm. Krogh and Dr. F make it to the lab where the monster has Peter. The monster rips Krogh's wooden arm off. Dr. F swings on a rope like Errol Flynn and kicks the monster into the sulfur pit. So the monster is dead. Maybe. Now here's where it gets weird. The entire town turns out to say goodbye to their new friends, the Frankensteins, who have donated their castle to the village and they are allowed to leave with no recourse. After holding a grudge for 25 years, they could just forgive and forget. Really? Before we end here, let's take a minute to talk about character names. Dr. F's first name was Wolf. Was that done to conjure images of the Wolfman? His wife's first name was Ilsa, the same as the actress that played the bride. Finally, his son was named Peter. Peter and the Wolf? But I digress. I mentioned earlier that the town was named Frankenstein. In the previous two Universal films, the town was called Goldstock. Carlos' daughter, Sarah, was born during the film, and it was rumored that he went to the hospital in full Frank attire. When Dr. F. examines the monster's blood under a microscope, the images are red blood cells overlaid on top of sperm cells. Ugh. Everyone knew that the bolts in the monster's neck were used to hook up electricity to him. However, this was the first film where they connected anything to these. Summary. Man takes a job in the country, but things go badly when he begins to spend too much time on his hobby and falls in with some bad local boys. I'd love to hear your comments, so keep them coming in. You can visit snarkymoviereviews.com where you can hear this or other podcasts. You can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, or WordPress, whatever suits you best. You can subscribe to the podcast feeds at iTunes or at Stitcher, both of which have links at snarkymoviereviews.com